We've all heard of the military expeditions of Rajendra Chola the first in Southeast Asia. These expeditions helped the Cholas subjugate Keda, the gateway to the Indian Ocean, and may have helped Tamil merchants secure a foothold in Southeast Asia and Chinese markets. More in this video here. But what if I told you that the reverse also happened and that one crazy king from Malaya tried to invade Sri Lanka and India? I'm Anirudh Kanisadi, historian author of Lord of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. So let me start by saying that the evidence for a lasting Chola presence in Southeast Asia is kind of shaky. There's only one inscription that claims that the Cholas attacked multiple cities there, the Tirukadayur inscription of Rajendra Chola I. But this inscription also mentions a city called the Great Tamralingam, firm and fierce in many great battles. This Tamralingam or Tamralinga was one among the many squabbling ports that dotted the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra in the 11th century. It was centered around Nakhonsi Thamarat or Nagara Sri Dharmaraja in the southern part of present-day Thailand. The evidence for Tamralinga's conquests in South Asia is fairly extensive. In the rise of Tamralinga and the Southeast Asian commercial boom in the 13th century, quite a name, Japanese scholar Sumio Fukami examined archaeological sources and court records from China. Up to the 1100s, Chinese sources used the term Sanfochi to refer to a number of Southeast Asian states. But after that, they mention embassies from only a single power, Danmaling or Tamralinga. Danmaling, according to the Chinese, ruled all of the Malay Peninsula and was one of the dominant states of the region. In the Malay Peninsula, crossroads the Maritime Silk Road, archaeologist Michel Jacques Guac, I hope I got that right, argued that there was a commercial boom in the Malay Peninsula in the 12th to 13th centuries. He found a sudden increase in the number of finds across sites. Beads, ceramics, and glass items from West Asia were discovered, and sites in Tamralinga itself showed a sudden increase in the production of high-quality ceramics. That suggests that seasoned artisans had become active there, either through immigration or forcible relocation. What we can say for sure is that by the 1200s, Tamralinga had become a major power and had a prosperous elite class with a taste for luxury. But it was still an upstart. It had to justify and legitimize its rule. In Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, political, religious, and cultural relations from AD 1000 to AD 1500, historian W. M. Sirisena examines a Sri Lankan Buddhist text called the Hattavanagala Viharavamsa. I got that right. It describes a king known as Chandrabhanu, a lion in prowess unto the rutting elephants who are the kings of many other countries who had deluded the whole world by a show of service to the world and to Dharma, who was determined on taking possession of the sovereignty of Lanka, who came from Tamralinga country. This quote reflects the depiction of Chandrabhanu in another Lankan Buddhist chronicle called the Chulavamsa. A king of the Javakas, known by the name of Chandrabhanu, landed with a terrible Javaka army under the treacherous pretext that they were also followers of the Buddha. Book 83, stanza 37. Javaka is a generic term used for Southeast Asians. So, what does all this mean? The Buddhist relics of Sri Lanka, especially the tooth relic and the bowl relic, were believed to have miraculous powers. As an up-and-coming new power, Tamralinga needed to legitimize control over the polities of Southeast Asia, many of which were Buddhists. So King Chandrabhanu of Tamralinga arrived in Lanka intent on seizing these relics. He had a large army equipped with poisoned arrows and some sort of ballista, according to the Chulavamsa. Chandrabhanu must have had access to ships, raiders, and logistics providers to send such a significant force across the seas to Lanka. The Chulavamsha mentions that the Lankans had also raided Burma a few decades before this. So, Rajendra Chola's raids were just the tip of the iceberg as far as Indian Ocean marauding was concerned. And not all raids originated from India. Other Indian Ocean powers raided each other as well. But there was something different about what King Chandrabhanu wanted. Chola raids mostly aimed at tribute and regime change, more in this video here. But Chandrabhanu wanted to build an Indian Ocean Empire commanding both the Pak and Malacca Straits. Not only did he raid Lanka, but he also attempted to conquer and rule it. Many places in the Jaffna Peninsula today have names that may originate from Chandrabhanu's conquests, including Javakacheri, which, is, which literally means Javaka Settlement, and Javakotte, Javaka Fort. And securing the tooth relic would also have given Chandrabhanu a claim to the throne of Lanka itself. 
But unfortunately for Chandrabhanu, the Pandya dynasty of southern India was not happy that a new power was trying to rise in their backyard. Chandrabhanu paid tribute to them while quietly recruiting large numbers of Tamil and Sinhala mercenaries. He then attempted to conquer the rest of the island in 1262. This immediately led to an act of balancing worthy of modern geopolitics. The Pandyas allied with other Lankan kings took to battle and beheaded Chandrabhanu. His son was left in charge of the Jaffna Peninsula but was eventually replaced. With this costly gamble brought to a close, the main Tamralinga kingdom was severely weakened. By the early 1300s, it was conquered by the Thai kingdom of Sukhothai and vanished into the tides of history. The medieval Indian Ocean world was one of endless complexity. The more we try to maintain the idea of India as its center, the less able we are to see what it really was. One where the subcontinent was one power among many. One where its kings were just one group of ambitious people among many. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anarbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Akanisati. We'll see you next week.